Welcome to the Nashville Area Chamber's presentation of the 2015 Education Report Card for Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. The report is in its 24th year, and the report has two purposes. One is to inform the community about the progress of Metro Schools and to offer recommendations for improvement to the school system. One way we help inform the community is through social media. So if you're going to tweet or use Facebook during the presentation, I encourage you to reference the bookmarks that you were given on your way in and use hashtag report card 15 today during, the, uh, during our session. The presentation is also being live tweeted by the chamber, which you can follow at, at Nash Chamber. Spreading the, media, spreading the word through social media is important, but so too is physically convening a group to hear this report. The chamber knows that when the business and community leaders come together to discuss education policy and improvement, we generate further interest, uh, further interest and more importantly, further involvement in our schools. We convene this committee annually because of our firm belief that excellent pub an excellent public school system is absolutely essential to the continued prosperity of our city and our region. And when we ask the business community what issues are most vital and most important to them, education always rises to the top because business owners see firsthand the life experiences of their employees and the life experiences of their future employees, and they know that education is the foundation of prosperity for every individual in this region. There are other people in this room that work on generating prosperity in other ways, creating a policy environment that's favorable to prosperity, and I'd like to recognize the elected officials who are with us today. So please raise your hand um, and hold your applause until the end because there is a substantial number of, uh, of those elected officials with us. Of course, Mayor Megan Berry, who you will hear from later. Uh, Joanne Brannon is here from the, from the school board. John Ray Clemens from the state assembly is with us. Um, Erica Gilmore, Metro Council person at large is with us. The, um, Mina Johnson is with us as well. We know where there you are over there. And uh, Freddie O'Connell, Metro Council, is with us. Freddie, I'm looking for Freddie's hand. Okay, there he is, right on the front row. Um, Mary Pierce from the school board is with us as well. Jason Powell is with us uh, as well. Annie, Anna Shepard from the Metro School Board is with us. And uh, Brett Withers from the Metro Council is also with us. Great. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for those public officials. Ah. Okay, Elisa, you're going to get your own individual applause. Elisa Kim from the school board as well. <laughs> Thanks for making that clear, Whitney. I appreciate that. Um, so before we begin the program, I just want to say a few thanks. First of all, to the committee. Uh, it is an arduous task, maybe the most time-consuming time and most difficult task we ask volunteers to undertake as they meet weekly for the fall for hours on Friday to, uh, to, to dig deeply into the education arena. So I want to say thank you to the committee members and, of course, the co-chairs. Also want to say thanks to MNPS. MNPS, through these 24 years, has been a partner in this process, very engaged and very involved. And I want to say thanks to MNPS also for their, uh, for their deep engagement. So now, I, oh, and I want to thank Whitney. Whitney is the staff leader of this effort for us, Whitney Weeks. So Whitney, thank you for your great focus on this, on this project as well. <laughs> Okay, now I'm pleased to welcome to the stage Mark Hamilton of Interior Design Systems, who is the presenting sponsor for this event. event. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, IDS is a uh, commercial furniture company with a commitment to education. Our research and expertise is applied by students, faculty, and administrators at education institutions all across this great country. 
They rely on us to help ensure great experiences occur in the learning spaces. Likewise, the members of this year's committee relied on the research and expertise of others within the Metro schools, as well as throughout the community, and we learned about the district, the students it serves, and the challenges and opportunities that it faces. As general manager of presenting sponsor IDS, and as a report card committee member, I am pleased that you're all here today as we share our final report. We expect it to serve as a resource to the district, to the city's business and community leaders, and to the families of the students of the Metro School System. On behalf of IDS, thank you for being here today, and we hope you have a great time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, it is now my privilege to recognize the sponsors who make today's event and all the chamber events possible. Thank you again to our presenting sponsor, Interior Design Services. Thank you, too, to our pivotal, our pivotal partners, a partnership at the highest level for all chamber programs and events, Delic, Bassberry Sims, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, Community Health Systems, First Tennessee, and Ryan. We also appreciate our education advocate, Altria, and our technology partner, Atiba. We were also supported this year by Jimmy Stansel and Stansel Electric Company, who generously hosted all of our 2015 meetings. And we thank the Public Library for hosting us today. The 2015 Education Report Card Committee began its work on the last day of July and since then conducted interviews, analyzed data, and visited schools in order to develop this year's recommendations, commendations, and concerns. The report, which you'll receive a copy of at the end of the program, represents the committee's consensus view of the 2014-2015 school year in Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. It is now a personal privilege for me to give thanks to the 23 chamber volunteers who made up this committee. Harry Allen, Greg Bailey, Tiffany Corsi, Scott Craddock, Jared Delosier, Rob Elliott, Kate Reed Azell, Rashad, Rashad Fakrudin, Mark Hamilton, Meg Harris, James Jim Hartman, Jennifer Johnston, Tara, Lent, Tara Lentz, I apologize, Catherine McElroy, Marcy Melvin, the Honorable Freddie O'Connell, Tom Parrish, Anita Ryan, Becky Sharp, Christina Smith, Pat Smith, Dr. Jewel Wind, and Roland Yarborough. Um, it takes a special volunteer to serve on this committee, and it takes extraordinary leadership to chair it. Mr. Rob Elliott of Stansel Electric Company and Dr. Jewel Wynn of Tennessee State University have done outstanding work this year. I also want to thank MNPS liaison to the committee, Chief Operating Officer Fred Carr. Fred, hey, Fred. Um, who's attended all of our meetings and offered invaluable information throughout the process. I'd now like all of our committee members, our co-chairs, and Fred to please stand, and I hope the rest of you will join me in a round of applause. Uh, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Metropolitan Board of Education, Sharon Gentry. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, this is exciting. So I want to thank Ralph for recognizing the board members that are here, and I want to give you all a special thank you for taking time out of your day for joining us to uh, hear this report. Special thank you again to Ralph and the chamber staff um, for undertaking this effort that, um, in spite of what you might think, we actually do look forward to uh, every year. Um, I also want to thank uh, Rob Elliott and Dr. Jewel Wynn um, for their efforts in leading uh, us up to this point to these recommendations. So something interesting always happens every year that we get to do this, is that the, co the two co-chairs always have a meeting with me prior to this day. They give me a preview of what the recommendations are, make me promise not to just go off up here at the podium, um, which I wouldn't do. Uh, but I'm always uh, pleasantly pleased when they're pleasantly surprised, right? Because in spite of the recommendations that we get that may always seem and sound like there's something more that needs to be done, the fact of the matter is that there is. There's always going to be more to be done. But I'm always pleasantly surprised when they are pleasantly pleased 
at some of the things they actually find that they don't hear about in the media. And they get to visit some wonderful schools and encounter some wonderful students that are doing great things in this district. It doesn't take away from or undermine or negate any of the recommendations that are made, but I'm always, always excited when anyone gets to go into our schools and have an experience that doesn't exactly mimic the headlines, doesn't actually mimic what happens on the board floor. And so I thank you all for taking the time and each of the committee members that had an opportunity to visit our schools. Um, one of the things I will say about the comments at this point before they get revealed and, and something that I was also excited about and I shared this with the co-chairs is that there were actually some recommendations related to the state and that we can't do this by ourselves. The lift is heavy. It doesn't mean it's not our responsibility to own, but we need partnerships. And so in the introduction from um, our representative and supporting partner from IDS, when he actually said that this is a resource to the district, but also to businesses, that hopefully when you all take a look at this report, you will see opportunities to step up, to step into our schools, to reach out to us with a hand that says, how can we help? The challenge will always continue to be, however, that the conversation continues to mill around symptoms and not the problem. I have a whole lot of catchphrases and this is one of my favorite ones. I don't like talking about symptoms. I'd rather focus on the problem, but the problem is hard. The symptoms are easy. The symptoms make very good headlines. They make very good buzz phrases and catch words. They're easy to rally around. They give people things to talk about. And we're in a very interesting time this year with what you'll find and see in the report about the growth of the district. We're at the, at the verge of having a turnover of potentially five members of our board. And yet we are expecting consistent performance from our district. But the problem will always be seemingly insurmountable as long as our symptoms remain the headlines. And so as we stand here also, not only on the verge of turning over our board with five new members, we're looking for an amazing and outstanding, and the word we love to use, bold new director of schools. And so what I would challenge us, and particularly us as a board, is to remember that boldness has to be on both sides, not just in the director of schools, but we have to step up and be bold. And it doesn't look like what you may think it sounds like. It actually is, we have to be bold enough to look beyond the headlines, in spite of how easy they are to talk about, and how, how much fun they are to talk about, and how popular they are to talk about, and how many times it gets us mentioned and quoted in the paper. We have to force the conversation beyond the symptoms and talk about the problem. We have to be bold enough not to play into the rhetoric of the hour in an attempt to avoid being on the receiving end of a Twitter rant or a spiteful Facebook post. We actually also have to be bold enough to risk being called out in public participation. It's what we signed up for. But that doesn't make the job any easier. And I'll go ahead and say it, that as we stand here, getting ready to go into an election for five new seats, we've got to be bold enough to lose a vote to talk about what needs to be talked about. Bold enough to risk not having that seat because we decided to have the right conversation at the right time. Several years ago, a movie came out um, and Howard and I went to see it called A Time to Kill. I want you to know it took me probably 10 years to see that movie. Went to the movie theater, we sat there and we walked out. I looked at him, I said, I gotta go. I can't stay here. But one of the, when I finally, somewhere 10 years later, got to the end of the movie and Matthew McConaughey's character, when he asks the jury to close their eyes and he starts to tell the story of what happened to that one little girl. What I would ask the board and the chamber and the business community and the metro government and everyone else who's in a position to help is to close your eyes. And the next time you see data about a child and the reading scores about our students, the retention rates among our teachers and leaders in our buildings, 
Don't just imagine that there's a child, but imagine that it's yours. And then tell me what it is you want to hear talked about. What do you want the headlines to be? Who do you want to extend a hand to help? What resources would you like to see made available if it were your child? What partnerships would you like to see the district willingly enter into to ensure that the best of everything, from strategy to resources to tools and materials, are made available to each and every child? So as we stand here really thumping our chest about being the it city here in southern eastern part of the United States, doesn't say much if we can't say that we're the it district and we're providing all of it and the best of it for each and every child. So again, I thank all of you for being here. I thank the chamber, I thank my fellow board members, and I encourage you to join me in being bold. Thank you, Sharon, most sincerely. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Our committee of 23 spent a collective 750 hours of volunteer time to produce this report. Eight of my committee members are MNPS graduates and 10 are current MNPS parents. We heard from 55 educators, elected officials, and community leaders. We also visited one pre-K center, three elementary schools, two middle schools, and a high school, all between July and November. Our objective we were singularly focused on helping the families of nearly 82,000 students, individual students, enrolled in MNPS in our entire community. Understand the progress Metro National Public Schools is making toward its goal of providing an excellent education for every student. Each year, the committee makes recommendations designed to help improve the quality of education for MNPS students. It is not the act of recommending that is significant, Instead, it is the impact once a recommendation is implemented. With that in mind, we review the status of last year's recommendations. Annually monitor the implementation of MNPS's strategic plan through 2018. Implemented. The committee confirmed that each tier of schools, elementary, middle, and high, have their own strategic plans, each of which is aligned with, with Education 2018 the district strategic plan. Key components of Education 2018, such as student-based budgeting and principal autonomy, are being implemented. Reform the pay supplement system to financially reward teachers assuming leadership roles at their schools. Implemented. Metro schools allocated an additional $1.4 million to teacher leadership stipends. The district standardized the definition of teacher leadership roles and significantly increased the amounts of stipends so that they now range from several hundred dollars for lead teachers to several thousand dollars for instructional coaches. Catalog those issues most commonly identified as impeding school level autonomy in order to identify potential policy or statute changes. Implemented. MNPS identified and assigned a dollar figure to policies, mandates, and laws that make up the, the predetermined or locked portion of school budgets. Annually, a district-led committee of principals and central office administrators evaluates this catalog and explores the feasibility of decreasing that lock percentage. Metro School Board should recommit its adherence to policy governance by engaging in ongoing professional development not implemented. Metro School Board should time the hiring of a new director of schools to take place after the election of Nashville's mayor in 2015. Not implemented. Additional information about the 2014 recommendations can be found in this year's report, which you will receive at the conclusion of today's program. After our look back, we now look at the present as well as the future. In making an assessment about the performance of Metro schools, our committee looks primarily at the results of the district's own academic performance framework, a district-created measurement used to calculate each school's unique score. Metro schools developed the APF using four measures, academic progress, academic attainment and college readiness, achievement gap closure, and school culture and climate. 
Metro then classifies schools into one of five performance categories, excelling, achieving, satisfactory, review, and target. While Metro Schools has made clear progress since Tennessee's move to more rigorous academic standards beginning in 2010, we are disappointed that overall progress stalled during the 2014-2015 school year. Metro Schools' greatest challenges continue to be in elementary and middle school grades. Elementary schools gave the district's weakest performance, particularly in reading and language arts. The results of the academic performance framework have been discussed broadly in our community since October. What our committee wants to know, however, is more complex. We use the district's APF to answer four questions about how school performance specifically affects students. First, did the number of excelling and achieving schools increase? No. There was a net decrease of one school from 34 in 2014 to 33 in 2015. Second, did the number of students served by achieving and excelling schools increase? Yes. Approximately 16,600 MNPS students, 20% of the total students, attended a high quality school in 2015, which is up from 18% in 2014. Our third question, did the number of target schools, the lowest performing category according to the district's APF, decrease? The answer is no. In fact, there was a net increase of five schools from 13 in 2014 to 18 in 2015. All 18 target schools are elementary or middle schools. Finally, we ask, were there fewer students served by the district's lowest performing schools in 2015? No, there were not. In fact, an additional 2,000 students were enrolled in target schools last year. District-wide, a total of nearly 8,500 students, or one out of every 10, attended a lowest performing school. In addition to using the district's academic performance framework, this committee evaluates <clears throat> the preparation of students by reviewing the percentage of 11th graders who scored a 21 or higher on the ACT. With 73% of MNPS students qualifying for free or reduced lunch, the importance of scoring at least a 21, which earns students lottery-funded HOPE scholarship dollars, cannot be overstated. District-wide, the percentage of 11th graders hitting this mark inched up from 29 in 2014 to 30 in 2015. An improvement, this is still dramatically shy of the district's own goal of 50%. Three schools saw more than 50% of their students achieve this benchmark, Hume Fogg, MLK, and Middle College. At the other end of that spectrum, in three high schools, Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and Whites Creek, fewer than 10% of juniors achieved this goal. Receiving re much recognition is the improvement in the district's graduation rates. It rose from 78.7% in 2014 to 81.6% in 2015. And 18 of MNPS's 23 high schools saw an increase in graduation, graduation rates. This calculation is the number of students who graduate on time and is not necessarily reflective of all students who earn a, di a diploma in Metro schools. With last year's graduation of 81.6%, the district is nearing its previous high of 83% in 2010 when English learners and exceptional education students were given a fifth year to graduate. A third set of data the committee uses is results from annual testing. This includes end of course exams for school students and TCAP for fourth and eighth graders. District-wide, progress in reading and language arts was moderate or declined in 2015. As indicated by the orange or top line on the graph you see now, 56% of sophomores were proficient or advanced in 2015, an increase of 1% from 2014. This is according to the results of their English II end of course exams. Next, we look at eighth grade, indicated by the blue line where proficiency rates increased by six percentage points in reading and language arts last year, bringing to 41 the percent of students who leave middle school proficient or advanced in English. Finally, 
we see the purple line representing fourth grade. It is this performance our committee found particularly distressing. Reading and language arts scores fell by five percentage points to 36% proficient or advanced. This committee finds it unacceptable that a majority, 64% of MNPS's students, entered middle school this, this year, this fall, reading below proficient. Each year, the committee chooses a special area of focus. With that in mind, we study the district efforts around the recruitment and, and retention of excellent teachers. Administrators, education researchers, and principals all cite a highly effective teacher as the most important strategy to providing a quality education for students. Last year, MNPS employed 6,200 certified teachers in grades pre-K through 12. Of those, 653 were new to the district and most were new to teaching. When it comes to retention, nearly 16% of the district's teaching force leaves the classroom every year. We share with you now four of our most significant takeaways which ad with additional thoughts and observations from the committee available in our written report. Our first two observations go hand in hand. Metro schools must be more effective in recruiting from a national pool of applicants. Currently, 60% of MNPS teachers graduate from one of 15 teacher preparation programs, all of which are located in the southeast and more than half of which are located in Middle Tennessee. A national recruitment strategy will help bring in talented teachers as well as draw a more diverse pool of candidates. We agree with Metro School's position that the district's teachers should reflect the racial and cultural diversity of the district's students. In MNPS, approximately three out of four teachers are white. Meanwhile, 44% of their students are African American, 31% are white, and 21% are Hispanic. A national recruitment strategy means the district is competing for talented teachers against such metropolitan districts as Houston, Chicago, the District of Columbia, Atlanta, and Austin, all of which pay their first year teachers more than MNPS. In addition to offering a competitive salary and benefits, which we do regionally but not nationally, applicants of all colors, religions, and ethnicities must think of Nashville as an appealing city in which to live and work. Recruitment of candidates is important, and that recruitment includes having in place an effective process for those applying as well as those for hiring. This is not the current experience according to those teachers and principals with whom we spoke. They describe two different systems that do not work well together. Instead of a system that adds values, adds value, principals and applicants shared how they found ways to work around what is currently in place. Additionally, an inability to access email and student information, failure to receive paychecks, and inconsistent onboarding were frequently cited as frustrations by new MNPS teachers. These issues can and must be resolved. Once a teacher becomes part of Metro Schools, keeping them, keeping them here is paramount. According to data from the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, only half of the graduates from teacher, Tennessee's teacher education programs are still in classrooms four years later. Within, MPS, within MNPS, approximately 860 certified teachers, 16% of the teaching force, left the district each year for the past five years. Making the loss even more acute is the fact that 52% of teachers not returning to the classroom were evaluated as being effective or highly effective at educating students. MNPS, leaves, M M MNPS teachers leave for three primary reasons. School culture, dissatisfaction with current administration, or personal reasons. The MNPS teachers we met emphasize how important a principle-driven, school-specific vision is to ensuring a healthy school cult culture. Some school leaders excel at this, while others do not. A principal's ability to create and maintain a healthy, positive school culture is critical to teacher and student retention and can be greater supported by the district. Teachers and principals also shared that educators want opportunities to improve their teaching skills. This desire could be addressed through a stronger, more coordinated offering of professional development opportunities and increased peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Finally, within, MP within MNPS, nearly 75% of children live in poverty. 20% of students speak a language other than English. The challenges and demands our teachers face is daunting. 
We met teachers who feed, clothe, and counsel the children in their classrooms. And that is in addition to explaining mathematical concepts to them and teaching them to read. Our committee recognizes these challenges and acknowledges the great, exhausting effort so many teachers pour into their students each and every day. Education is a challenging, complex environment, and there is an acute need for increased teacher support to counter these pressures. While we believe there is an enormous amount of work to be done by natural schools, we believe with equal passion and conviction in the potential of this district. In every school, there are talented, dedicated teachers, principals, and students. In recognition of their efforts and successes, our committee offers annual commendations that recognize bright spots in the district. While the three commendations are explained in detail in the report, we do take time this morning to commend Metro Schools for its continued support of principal autonomy. This autonomy empowers school leaders to make decisions specific to their school communities. Principals eliminate or add positions without first seeking district level approval. They develop their school's budgets and create unique school improvement plans that meet the needs of their students. The school leaders we interviewed cite greater independence as the single most effective way to improve school culture and academic performance. Just as we identified bright spots, our committee has concerns that we believe are serious impediments to the district's success. Again, the concerns are detailed in our written report, though we do choose to share this morning one particular concern. The district is not on track to ensure 50% of its students earn a 21 or higher on the ACT, which is a goal outlined in Education 2018. While graduation rates and end of course scores continue to rise, too few MNPS students are college ready, according to their performance on the ACT. The district's growth in this area has marginally increased for the last five years, but the pace is hardly fast enough. This is achieved in large part by increasing the academic performance of elementary and middle school students. The ACT is as much a combination of a student's entire education as anything. As we near the conclusion of, this, of our portion of this morning's program, we are eager to share the committee's five recommendations, each of which was carefully chosen with the expectation that implementation ultimately supports students and accelerates academic pro progress within Metro schools. Metro schools should implement a dramatic intervention for all students reading below grade level in first through third grades. Children who have not mastered reading and language skills by the end of third grade have an increasingly difficult time comprehending academic material in later grades. Literacy has, for several years, been identified me by Metro schools as a problem area. We believe the time has come for Metro schools to work more aggressively to implement the most effective means possible for teaching literacy to its youngest students. The district must, must also ensure the teachers and families of these young students receive the support and tools necessary to be good educators and strong partners. The state of Tennessee should strengthen the current pre-K program by requ requiring districts to reapply for early childhood grants with a plan for ensuring high quality and coordination with early elementary grade instruction. Improved elementary outcomes can be achieved by increasing the impact of quality early learning opportunities. Though the discussion about long-term effects of pre-K continues, Metro Schools is committed to providing access to structured learning for the city's youngest residents. Similarly, we believe the state would strength, should strengthen its commitment to early childhood education by focusing on the quality of the programs offered. MNPS should increase collaboration amongst educational delivery systems, including charter, zoned, and choice schools. Teachers and principals benefit from learning about the practices of their peers, regardless of school, of school type. Metro schools should consider bringing back its annual shared practices summit with its focus on the exchange of ideas. It should also increase the intentionality of connecting executive and assistant principals from schools with similar de demographics and challenges, regardless of school type or grade served. The state of Tennessee should explore offering first year teachers increased choice benefit packages with any savings directed toward increasing starting salary. Since July 2014, 
Tennessee has offered a hybrid retirement program option for state employees, including teachers, as an alternative to the traditional Tennessee consolidated retirement system. There is still room, however, to produce an option that increases teachers' take-home pay. While this is being explored, MNPS should look at the types of locally determined benefit packages it offers teachers. The goal, again, would be, to, would be to identify savings and return those savings to teachers' paychecks. Metro schools should conduct an independent, comprehensive review of its human capital department using HR professionals from some of Nashville's leading businesses. This committee identified many opportunities to strengthen the recruitment and retention efforts within MNPS. And many of them stem from system issues within the human capital department. Instead of looking at issues and problems in isolation, a holistic view of the entire human resources system should be reviewed. With hundreds of businesses, nonprofit, and faith organizations headquartered here in Nashville, MNPS should take advantage of the availability of human resource experts and practitioners to, review, to lead this review. We encourage MNPS and the appropriate officials from the state of Tennessee to give these recommendations careful thought and consideration. We look forward to reporting the progress toward implementation next year. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mayor Megan Berry. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be with you here today. And I know we've already done a shout out for most of the elected officials here, but I also just wanted to point out that Criminal Court Howard Gentry is also with us today. I also wanted to tell Ralph that I'm not here to offer anybody a job, Ralph, so it's, it's all good. You're okay. <laughs> and thanks to the Chamber for all of that you do. I want to also take a moment and thank our interim school director, Chris Henson, his staff, and all of the members of the school board. The work that you do isn't easy. And the fact that you do this work is really important to our city. It's the most important work that we do, and that's educating our children. Finally, I also want to thank the members of the Chamber Education Report Card and their committee, especially Jewel Wynn, my good friend, and Rob Elliott. This has taken tremendous amounts of work, volunteer time, and this is volunteer. They do this because they love Nashville. They do this because they love our kids. And that is what we need to remember. The 2015 recommendations are good ones, and I'm pleased that I had the opportunity to see some of this um, earlier. And you've all given us some very important targets to hit and some excellent data that we can work with. And we do have to have, one, have one goal, and that one goal, and I think we want to make sure that we remember that that's our common goal, is that we want a great education experience for every child, regardless of the zip code that they live in. This morning, I started my day at Glengarry Elementary. I was with Principal Gibbs, and we handed out over 400 coats. The firefighters raised the money, and they brought and fitted every child in that school for a new coat. Those are the challenges that we have in our school system. Our schools are asked to do more than just educate our kids. So how do we ultimately achieve the goal? of having a great education system. We do it one way. and We do it by working together. I know there are differences in this room about the best way to educate our kids. Good people can disagree on the means and still agree on the end. And I think that everyone has to be willing to give a little. Everyone has to be willing to recognize that each approach has its merits and each way whether it's a traditional zoned school, whether it's a magnet school, whether it's a charter school, they've all produced some wonderful results. And one of the recommendations is that we come together and learn what those great outcomes are and how to do more of them, regardless of the school. We all want the same thing. And I'm committed, as your mayor, to bringing everyone together for that shared goal. Last night, I hosted a youth violence summit. We had over 300 folks attend. These two components, education and youth violence, are connected in our community. And finding that way is critical. One of the recommendations that we heard today starts around teacher recruitment and retention. It's key. We have to be more competitive. 
not just with the teachers here in Middle Tennessee, but you saw the results. We have to actively go after great teachers from around the United States. We're attractive to young people. Young people want to come to Nashville. This is a great opportunity to bring the best and the brightest to here. But we have to make sure they have a salary that works, and they have the right benefits, and they have the right culture. As you saw, more than half of the, of the teachers that leave on any given year were considered highly effective teachers. They were great at what they do. Most people who are great at what they do love going to work if the conditions are right. But we're struggling to keep a lot of our best and brightest teachers. That fire inside them, the fire that gets them up every day, has faded. And we have a responsibility to fix that. I know the district is working to figure out why this is happening, why our teachers are leaving, but it's critical that we take that information and we make the changes that we need so that our teachers will stay and continue to love teaching in Metro. We also have to support the teachers who do stay, help them grow in their roles by providing excellent professional development opportunities. The report card raises the question about where that resides, who owns that responsibility to make sure that we have a coordinated effort for stronger opportunities for teachers to develop and do what's best for each one of their schools. Those are some of our retention opportunities, but we've got to work on some of our recruitment. The Chamber has a great campaign called Work IT Nashville. They go out and they recruit IT workers. We need to do this for our teachers. And as we create more affordable housing in our city, we have to set aside housing for some of our first year teachers who, because they are already making such great sacrifices for our public service, we have to make sure they can afford to live here. I was pleased to see that the report card urged the state to strengthen our pre-K instruction. Pre-K gives more of our kids a chance to succeed. The Nashville Public Education Foundation identified that same need in its reset report last spring. And I agree. I said this a lot in the campaign. I want Nashville to have a true universal pre-K program for every child. We know that if we're going to hit that college ACT readiness, our kids have to be kindergarten ready in order for them to go on and be college ready. The solutions that we face are not gonna come out and solved overnight, but we do have to have a sense of urgency. And when Chair Gentry talks about being bold, she understands that sense of urgency, as do our school mem board members. A child doesn't have the luxury of being stuck in a bad school because they don't have the luxury of time, and we don't either. Nashville has, trem has tremendous growth, but that could all change if we don't get our education right. I just came from the airport where we made an announcement about a new direct flight to San Francisco. We want that connection to IT. We want our kids to have those opportunities, and we want to continue to strengthen our workforce. But don't get me wrong. Education isn't just about a workforce. It's about democracy. You can't have a democracy unless you have an educated public. So we all have to come together. We all have to find the best answers for our school system. And I know we're gonna do that as we continue to search for our new school director. That's going to be key. We learned a lot through the last engagement process with the community as we looked through that search last year. We're gonna build on that. So let's keep the spirit going. Let's keep working together. As a community, our kids deserve this. Our kids need an education system that works for them. Thank you again for this report. Thank you to the chamber for all you do. I'd now like to introduce Chris Henson. He has been a steady and wonderful hand to guide our Metro schools while we search for a director. And I thank you for that, Chris. Come on up. Thank you, Megan, Mayor Barry. Thank you, Megan and Mayor Barry. <laughs> we greatly appreciate the support that you continue to show to our schools. The Director Search Academy Committee that your office is leading in partnership with the Public Education Founda Foundation is vitally important for the future of our school district. 
I've said since I stepped into the inter this interim director role back in June that I'm happy to serve in this capacity. I've done it before, but I'm not interested in the permanent role. I am, however, extremely interested in seeing our city recruit top-notch candidates. We've come a long way in recent years, but we need a visionary leader to carry us forward if we're going to fulfill our goal of becoming the highest performing urban school district in the country, and I believe we can. So again, Mayor Barry, thank you for your leadership during this critical time. I appreciate the hard work that the Chamber and volunteer committee members put into developing this report each and every year. It speaks volumes about our business community that the Chamber has made education its number one priority and that it invests such a great deal of time and resources into supporting our school district's continued improvement. I'm going to respond on behalf of the school district to some of the report card recommendations, but I also want to take this opportunity to describe the progress we're making this school year. We're in an interim period, but we're not standing still. We have a strategic plan, as mentioned, Education 2018, that was approved by our school board, and we're continuing to work toward goals outlined in that plan. This plan is centered around personalized learning for our students. Our school district is diverse, and so too are the needs of the students that we serve. To meet those needs, we have to meet every student where they are when they come to us and challenge them with high expectations, all of them. We're doing this by empowering our principals to be instructional leaders in their buildings. Personalized learning can't happen through top-down mandates. It happens when high-quality school leaders who know their schools and know the needs of their unique student populations are able to, de able to design their own instructional plans. We've empowered our principals to do this in a very real way by giving them direct control of over half of our school district's $800 million budget. Through student-based budgeting, which went district-wide this year for the first time, schools are given a funding allocation based on the individual needs of the students they serve, and principals are given the flexibility to align their resources to meet those needs. The report card committee recognized this important step, and I appreciate principal autonomy being included in the list of this year's commendations. I won't address every report card recommendation, but I do want to respond to a couple of them. First, on the recommendation for dramatic intervention for all students reading below grade level in the first through the third grades. As a district, we agree with the committee. Success in elementary school is synonymous with success in reading. We know that children who lack the ability to read at grade level are likely to face problems in other subjects as they move through their education. The early years of elementary school are our opportunity to curtail that risk. They are critical years. We also agree that literacy needs to be an increased area of focus. This has been a point of discussion for our school board as well. Academic achievement data from last year point to declining reading levels as a statewide trend. However, as I've said before, specifically to our principals, this doesn't excuse the need for us to focus on changing that trend here at the local level. Through student-based budgeting, principals can hire staff to support the academic needs of their schools, and this would include instructional coaches and literacy coaches who work with teachers on best practices in the classroom. As an additional support measure for our lowest performing schools, we offer elementary schools that rank in the bottom 20% of schools on our academic performance framework the opportunity to participate in our district reading initiative called Reading Recovery. This program was bolstered this year with an additional $1.4 million investment thanks to the support of the Mayor's Office, the Metro Council, and our school board. Participating schools receive a full-time Reading Recovery teacher who works with the school's lowest achieving first grade students. This program is currently in 20 of our schools. It's a short-term, early intervention program that's one part of our layered approach to literacy instruction. Our school district is large, 
and the need is so great that we may need that we need many layers of literacy intervention in all of our schools, but especially in our most high need schools. Other supports include reading interventionists who support the next tier of low performing schools, and those would be those at risk of falling into the bottom 20%. We also have a literacy partnership with Lipscomb University that provides intensive training to literacy coaches, including some of our English learner coaches. This allows us to work on establishing literacy leaders in all of our schools, which is something we need to do to make the type of impact our district needs in this area. Improved and expanded literacy resources and principal training on literacy are some other tools we're using to improve reading proficiency with our youngest students. We're proud of the work we're doing in this area, but we know we need to do more. We've targeted our resources to help our lowest performing schools, but the reality is all schools have some low performing readers. Additional funds could support the expansion of this program and broaden the pool of available resources for principals to add literacy supports to their school plans when they see the need. As another way to bolster achievement in these early grades, the report card also mentions the importance of aligning our pre-K curriculum to the instruction taking place in our elementary grades, and we fully agree. Within the federal pre-K grant we were awarded, we have, for the, for the first time as a district, provided standardized curriculum for all of our pre-K classrooms. And as a next step in that process, we've hired a veteran principal to work on aligning instructional practices from pre-K to third grade and also establishing metrics to properly measure those improvements. We'll be sharing this information with our school board at their next meeting on January 12th. We're excited about the benefits we know this work will begin producing very soon. The other committee recommendation I want to address is the independent comprehensive review of our human capital uh, department using HR professionals from some of Nashville's leading businesses. As members of the Council of the Great City Schools Organization, which represents the largest school districts across the country, we're able to access the expertise of large urban school districts through peer reviews. We're planning to reach out to them as a next step to perform an independent analysis of our HR division. We agree that teacher recruitment and teacher retention are a challenge for our district and for all school districts in some regard as the interest in enter entering the education field has waned over time. But we also agree that we have no greater lever to improve student outcomes than having a highly effective teacher in every classroom. And so the work to attract and retain top teaching talent should consistently be a priority for our district. And it's, appropriate, it's appropriately included as a strategy in our district strategic plan. While I support the report card committee's recommendation, I think it's important to point out that teacher recruitment and retention is not an issue that one department can solve. Because the experiences that our high quality teachers have that make them love where they work or choose to leave where they work are impacted by the school environment, by many different departments, and by the culture of the district as a whole. Along these lines, we recently completed a teacher retention plan which was one of the recommendations in the Metro Performance Audit released at the beginning of the year. This plan was presented to our school board at their meeting a week ago. It was the culmination of four months of research and teacher focus groups by a cross-department work group. The work group's own findings were that most teachers who leave Metro schools leave for personal reasons. That accounts for half of our attrition according to our exit surveys. But the next top two reasons were school culture or dissatisfaction with the administration. We have to remember that not all attrition is bad. We should expect to find dissatisfaction, for instance, from low performing teachers or those who realize teaching is not the profession for them. But what's concerning to me is the number of teachers we lose who are top performers. Teachers who score a four or five on their team evaluation, for instance. These are the teachers we want to keep. The teacher retention work group developed a, a set of recommendations that focus on four big themes. 
central office culture, principal quality, onboarding and teacher induction processes, and elevating great teaching. We look forward to beginning work on implementing these strategies. And we agree with the report card committee that there's still more we can do to improve the structure and practices of our human capital department. Teacher retention is not the only issue we've tried to tackle this school year. Most of you have probably heard the media reports earlier this semester about our bus driver shortage. We need over 500 full-time bus drivers to be fully staffed. And we started the school year about 50 drivers short. By October, that number had grown to over 100 vacancies. The pay we were offering wasn't competitive in the local market for commercial drivers. On average, we were losing five drivers a week to other job opportunities in Nashville. Our transportation department and our human capital department came together to solve the problem. We took the time to listen to our bus drivers and to study the local job market. Earlier this month, we rolled out a new pay structure that would allow bus drivers to earn more income as they gain experience. To me, this was a great example of what can result from collaboration and innovative thinking. It also highlighted the significance of our support employees. Whether they're driving a bus, serving children lunch, or assisting in a school's front office, every Metro Schools employee contributes to our ability to run an effective and efficient school operation and ultimately give each of our students a great education. We're already beginning to plan for next year's budget, beginning with our capital needs requests. We opened two new elementary schools this year to address overcrowding. Relieving overcrowding in our elementary grades and renovating our dated high schools continue to be a primary theme of our capital needs discussions. We're unique among urban school systems in that our student population continues to increase rather than declining. On average, we've been growing an additional 1,500 to 2,000 students each school year. I believe that's indicative of Nashville being a dynamic city, as well as more families recognizing the value of our public schools. We need to continue to plan for this growth, and that requires significant capital investment every year. We look forward to engaging with the Mayor's Office and the Metro Council on this issue, this issue as our budget planning progresses. As I said earlier, this may be an interim period, but we're not standing still. We're continuing to implement our strategic plan, solve challenges that, as they come along, and plan for the future. When the board hires our new leader, I believe we'll be well positioned to take our school district to the next level of success. Again, I appreciate the Chamber and the Report Card Committee for all of the work, the many, many hours that goes into this annual report. Also appreciate Fred Carr serving as our liaison from the school district and attending all of these meetings every Friday morning. We appreciate the constructive nature of the report and the support it provides for issues that we agree need to be addressed. As we do each year, we'll study these recommendations carefully and work to implement them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Barry and Mr. Henson, for being with us today. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for being here today. We appreciate your being part of this important conversation about public education in Nashville. Copies of the report are available outside the auditorium. You can also find it available online at nashvillechamber.com. I want to thank again our presenting sponsor, Interior Design Services. And thank you, too, to our pivotal partners, Delic. Bassberry Sims, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, Community Health Systems, First Tennessee, and Ryan. We also appreciate our education advocate, Altria, and our technology partner, Atiba. Thanks also to those of you who have invested in this region's success by being a chamber member. We certainly appreciate your involvement and your membership. And finally, for those of you with questions about joining the chamber or getting involved with our education advocacy work, uh, talk to any chamber staff person afterwards. We'd be glad to have that conversation with you. Um, finally, I'm just going to take a point of personal privilege to thank again the committee members, uh, 750 hours of volunteer work, uh, and I'll miss you on Friday mornings. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>